now recording. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm looking down here. All right. So <laughs> um, that's where the camera is. All right. So um, thanks so much, Denise, uh, for inviting me and for the nice presentation. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, show you the work in my lab. Um, and I'm very excited um, uh, to you know, meet uh, with some of you. I, I'm sorry that I had to postpone the one-on-one -on -one meetings. I've been involved in grad recruitment all morning with my own department, so I apologize. But I am really excited, um, and I guess this, this will happen next week. Um, also, I know this is primarily a vision group. My work is somatosensory um, or somatosensation, um, but there is clear evidence that a lot of um, there, there's a lot of common mechanisms happening between the two senses. And I will do my best to um, highlight uh, those instances where um, uh, both systems, um, uh, you know, uh, use uh, similar mechanisms. You know, to not bore you too much with haptics and somatic sensation. Um, all right. So, uh, yes. So, uh, let's see here. So, I'm going to switch to laser point of view. Okay, great. So um, my lab studies um, um, aims to understand the mechanisms mediating object sensing and grasping with the hand, right? Um, and with an emphasis on how sensory information is used to support motor actions. And I'm really fascinated uh, with this problem. You know, um, the somatosensory system is the first system that develops, and it's the last system that goes away when we die. Um, but more importantly, the somatosensory system is the primary system that enables us to solve one of the fundamental aspects or functions of humans and primates in general. And that is to directly enable, uh, interact with objects and people in the environment. And so through the sense of touch, we can explore a myriad of uh, different object features such as texture, stickiness, the shape, the temperature of, of objects. And we use them to perform certain actions, such as you know, manipulate uh, cell phones, pencils, but also to convey our intentions to other humans. Right? Um, this is a fundamental aspect. And um, this was—I just noticed that picture I'm, I'm putting here. The presidents of Canada and the U.S. together. Hopefully, one it'll happen one again, once again, and <laughs> soon. Um, all right, so um, our lab thinks about haptics um, as a multi-stage process along a cognitive, sensory, and motor axis. And you know, we, we, uh, our, our take is that haptic is almost always a goal-directed behavior. And this is illustrated in this video where this person, um, you can see that she is typing, she stops typing um, to uh, take a drink of water, right? And realize the goal of drinking that water. We can formalize the, uh, this, uh, these, haptics action, these haptic actions into a series of steps. First step is you know, the realization of a state and a goal formulation, i.e. I need to drink water. And then the generation of different predictions, so related to the object. So where the object is located um, uh, in, in space, um, what, is the, uh, what is the shape, what, is it cold, is it hot? And then once you generate those predictions, you start making an action, so the reaching, right? Um, then you touch the object, and then you manipulate that object, and you realize your goal. And my lab is primarily interested in understanding the mechanisms, the moment of the moment of contact with the object, what are the sensory uh, representations, and how those sensory representations are, gen are uh, biased or modulated by cognitive models such as priors, um, uh, so, such as priors. Today, however, I would mainly be focusing on uh, um, describing studies that deal with, that investigate mechanisms of um, integration of object-related signals in touch. So we study haptic using a comprehensive approach. Um, uh, we leverage the power of different animal models. And this is a compilation of all the grad and postdoc training I've done um, in my life. <laughs> uh, so, um, but we're very intentional. That's the key here. We're very intentional about this process. 
So we first try to uh, um, this, um, implement or you know characterize a particular behavioral phenomenon in human. Then we, to the best of our ability, try and generate a computational model that can explain these psychophysics uh, phenomena. Then we go in and we try and find evidence for the neural implementation of that model. And then when we can, we, per we perform circuit perturbation studies where we either do optogenetics or um, other chemical um, perturbation studies to understand, to better assign a causal role of these circuits to these um, um, behavioral functions. All right. So our working model is that haptic perception um, uh, is that haptic, perce haptic perception uh, is mediated by the integration of local and sensory inputs, such as the edges, the curvature, the um, uh, orientation, etc., with the proprioceptive signal, such as the spatial distribution of the fingers enclosing the object. So this is illustrated in the following model, the cartoon model. So imagine that all of these fingers, all of these circles are your fingers, so three fingers, and they're spatially apart. And the blue curves are these blue, um, yeah, curves are the surface profiles of the object onto that's that's um, that's imprinted onto the, your your finger. So based on these um, signals, the brain then derives an object that looks like a round ball. Right? And if you rotate it across, then you'll be able to feel the texture and build the representation. Oh yeah, that is a baseball. And of course, vision plays a pivotal role in this process um, by providing, in part by providing um, uh, priors, if you will, such as uh, priors that are related to the object features that we're going to grab, such as the shape, the size, the texture, motion, et cetera. So it's commonly known that uh, uh, tactile, perception, tactile object perception emerges late in the somatosensory processing stream. So here's a cartoon illustration of you know, the ascending, ascending pathway to, um, across the somatosensory system. Information at the periphery travels through the spinal cord, then it arrives at the thalamus. From the thalamus, information then is synapsed onto somatosensory cortex. Um, I realize that this is a very, very rudimentary and kind of outdated um, uh, um, diagram, but in bulk, it, this is most, mostly how information is conveyed to the somatosensory system. And then it is in S area S1 and S2, where detailed information about object features, such as um, motion and texture and all of these different um, yeah, features related to the object, they start to get analyzed. However, there are some studies that show that those information are not, it's not just um, uh, uh, specific to the somatosensory system, but rather these areas might uh, do send information to um, other uh, areas outside the somatosensory system, like uh, visual cortices and MT in particular, um, that are features uh, that are related, the process visual related feature information as the ones in touch. Now, whether that information that gets propagated to these areas are the one is, is there where that information gets processed and, and derived to derive a um, an, an overall a global uh, shape of the object or or whether that information and visual cortices support the processing in some sensory cortex is still unknown. It's still an, an active area of investigation. So the late model of tactile object perception has been mostly derived um, from data showing that cutaneous and proprioceptive inputs are themselves integrated at later stages of the neural process, processing stream in the somatosensory system. So this model, which is called the modality segregation model, indicates again that information from the periphery, from the mechanoreceptors, which encode cutaneous inputs, and proprioceptors, which encode proprioception, right? They ascend to the to cortex in segregated channels from the spinal cord that they synapse onto the thalamus, and they synapse onto distinct regions in the thalamus. The cutaneous inputs synapse onto the core region of the thalamus, um, in particular the BPL, right? Because we're dealing with the hand or with the body part with the limbs, and the proprioceptive inputs um, synapse on the sh outer shell of the core. 
From there, inputs go into neocortex, cutaneous inputs go into neocortex to primarily to, primarily to area 3B, uh, and some in area 1, whereas the corpus dentis inputs arrive in area 3A and 1 and 2. And it's after these initial inputs in area 1, 2, and beyond, where these two sources of signals, the cutaneous and proprioceptive signals, are integrated and are, are be, are start to get integrated to build a sort of overall global representations of objects. <clears throat> However, um, oh, and I should mention that yeah, there is evidence um, in the literature um, showing that this is this is right, um, or this is this. There's evidence for this model. So these are uh, maps of cutaneous and proprioceptive signals from a um, marmoset or an owl monkey, I should say, from the Stratovan and Dykes uh, paper. And you can see that cells uh, that have a cutaneous receptive field denoted in circle mostly live in area 3B, whereas cells with a proprioceptive input or a proprioceptive receptive field lie mostly in area 3A. And this is great, but one of the problems with this study and a lot of other studies that have been conducted in, to derive this modality segregation model, that they've been performed using uh, unreliable tools such as handheld probes um, and uh, manual displacement uh, by the experimenters. So we lack that sort of systematic, reliable uh, quantification of how these proprioceptive and cutaneous inputs are processed or integrated um, in cortex in general, right? As we typically do in lab studies, especially in vision, right? Um, and this mainly stems from the fact that stimulation of these, you know, tactile stimulation and proprioceptive stimulation, it's a really hard problem to solve, right? We don't have monitors, right? We don't have speakers. So we have to derive very, or devise very uh, sophisticated and uh, time consuming tools to properly or systematically and parametrically um, study these processes. So, um, so with that, what we did here was we devised one of these or designed and, and built one of these devices. These, this is a, um, uh, an experiment that we did where we took a motor that placed the animal's hand, where you can secure the animal's hand and then modulate the position of each finger, right? While at the same time, uh, provide different tactile stimulation at the precise skin location. So we modulated the D2, the, locate, the position of the second digit, the third digit, and the fourth digit in either vertical or horizontal displacements systematically, that's the key, and presented different oriented bars to those fingers, right? Um, with precise, um, with, with precision, right? The animal was performing a visual um, uh, discrimination task. And the goal of the study was to not to, uh, was to basically ascertain the proprioceptive and, and cutaneous integration mechanisms. Um, uh, what are the mechanisms that underlie this, this process, right? So here's an example, a video of the uh, monkeys, um, of the experiment. You can see, oh, come on. Come on. Uh, shoot, sorry. <laughs> of course, it's not going to play now. Uh, all right, let me just back up here. Oh, here we go. Sorry. So here's a play, uh, the video. Can you guys see it? All right. So you see the monkey's hand. It's fixed, and you have you see all the oriented bars being stimulated, stimulating the hand. Then we position the hand in a different, or the finger in a different place, and present the same exact tactile stimuli to the finger, right? So that's key to this process, right? So now we're modulating the proprioceptive state of the hand, but we're delivering the same tactile stimulus on the skin, right? Okay, so what we did was we perform extracellular recordings in the areas 3A, 3B, 1 and 2 uh, of somatosensory cortex, and uh, in three monkeys that were again performing a visual fixation task. And here's a timeline of the sequence of the experimental, uh, of the experiment. Uh, experiment start, then you perform a posture change, right? 
then at that same posture location, you presented all these different tactile stimuli. After you were, after we presented a, a battery of tactile stimuli, i.e., oriented bars in different locations and different um, angles, then we changed the posture and presented the same type of stimuli over and over again while the animal was doing the task. So to analyze uh, uh, proprioception um, effects, what we did was we looked at the timeline prior to the tactile stimulation. We perform um, our analysis um, using this regression equation, which where this term, um, the initial terms gives you um, uh, proprioceptive uh, effects that are explained by modulations within a single digit. Whereas these terms uh, give you proprioception effects that are explained uh, by interactions across digits. Tactile stimulation or tactile and proprioceptive integration effects were analyzed during the tactile stimulation, obviously, across different postures. All right. So uh, first, let me present you data showing where and how proprioception is represented in S1. So um, if you recall, the modality segregation model shows that um, uh, inputs, proprioceptive inputs from the thalamus are primarily um, uh, outputted to area 3A, one and two, in particular area 3A. And what you can see here is a plot of different hand position organized as a function of firing rate. This is prior to the tactile stimulation. According to the, to the modality segregation model, we find that yes, cells in area 3A do have um, a preference for a particular proprioceptive uh, response, right? Um, uh, such as this, and red is the maximal response, yellow, whitish is less uh, firing. However, when we present tactile stimulation, we see that this, that this um, tuning relationship of proprioception changes by the addition of the tactile stimulation. And namely, you have increased suppression around particular uh, proprioceptive states with uh, the tactile stimulation, right? Um, same effects happen in area 3B. We see here a cell that is tuned to a particular um, uh, hand conformation or hand posture, and when we present the tactile stimuli, now we see that this that this cell response to the tactile stimulus changes as a function. Right. So, um, when we look at the entire population of our recordings, we see that the vast majority of cells in area three A, three B, one and two, and are multimodal, i.e., they respond to both cutaneous and proprioceptive inputs. However, I want to make clear that the canonical model, the modality segregation model, is not totally incorrect. You do see a vast majority of proprioceptive neurons in area, in area 3A, um, sorry, that area 3A responds mostly to proprioception as opposed to cutaneous inputs, right? Um, similarly, in area 3B, most neurons respond to cutaneous versus proprioceptive inputs, right? Unimodal neurons, I should make that distinction. But clearly, the vast majority of neurons across all of these different areas are multimodal, i.e. are integrating um, uh, inputs from both modalities. So um, we, uh, we see that um, we found that these proprioceptive and cutaneous inputs are integrated using two sets of mechanisms. One that integrates inputs using additive or linear mechanisms, as shown in this graph. So what you can see here, is a, the response of, um, of a neuron to four different or uh, proprioceptive conditions. And zero is when the tactile stimulus is invented. And obviously this is the different posture. So you can see that this neuron has a preferential response to a particular posture, right? However, when we present the tactile stimulus, the neuron responds to, um, in, 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 this neuron responds uh, to the tactile stimulus. The key here is that the response of this, of this neuron is uh, homogeneous across all of these different uh, proprioceptive conditions, i.e. it's a linear addition, right? The integration of effects can be explained by a linear addition of the two components. However, other sets of neurons for, uh, integrated in these effects or these uh, inputs um, using nonlinear mechanisms. So this neuron, you can see that it's not responsive to any proprioceptive condition. But then uh, after the tactile stimulus, after the tactile stimulus was 
presented, you can see that this neuron um, responded differently depending uh, according to the proprioceptive state of the hand. Sorry, let me just switch to take the point. Um, according to the proprioceptive state of the hand, right? But um, one thing that you'll notice is that these integration effects are uh, occurring much later, right? Than uh, in the response around, they starting around 100 milliseconds. So then we quantified uh, these effects in more, uh, more clearly, uh, in more detail, sorry, um, by analyzing the moment in time when those, um, when, we, when we first um, observed an integration effect, right? And this is a cumulative distribution function of those data. Um, what you can see here is that the integration effects of multimodal nonlinear neurons happen much later here in solid black than the integration effects of multimodal linear neurons shown in, in dots, in the gray dot, or in gray lines, um, or the median answer responses here. But what's important here is to indicate or to showcase that it's not that these neurons have a sluggish response. It's not that these neurons, you know, take a long time to respond to both cutaneous and proprioceptive inputs, but rather you can see here that at time zero, this neuron responded to the cutaneous input, right? To the cutaneous stimuli. Um, uh, stimuli. But the divergence across proprioceptive condition happened much later, suggesting that these integration effects are um, uh, emerging or emerge from uh, feedback or recurrent mechanisms. So to summarize, um, um, I showed you for this first study, I showed you that cells in area 3B 3A, 1, and 2 integrate both proprioceptive and cutaneous inputs. And then there's at least two coding mechanisms for integrating these signals um, with nonlinear integration effects mediated by feedback um, mechanisms. Okay, so I showed you evidence of how proprioceptive signals are encoded in neocortex and how these um, uh, proprioceptive and cutaneous signals are integrated. And as Studies have shown these signals are encoded in cortex in a somatotopic dependent manner. So for instance, um, cells that um, respond to locations on the lower part of the body are encoded in the medial part of the brain, whereas the face and the hand representations are encoded more uh, later, laterally. And here's a map of uh, somatosensory cortex in a monkey, sorry, is it strictly strictly contralateral, Manny? Are you only seeing this in the contralateral contralateral? Yeah, yeah. So um, for somatis for primary somatosensory cortex or for area three B, um, yeah. typically uh, receptive fields are um, you know are contralateral. Okay. But when you get to secondary somatosensory cortex, and there's evidence for area one and two that there is cross. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Oh, and I should have mentioned before, please stop me if something doesn't, um, uh, doesn't sit well with you or you have any questions. So, um, so one thing to, to note here, so um, this is, again, somatosensory cortex, area 3B is right here. You'll see more medial, you see the tail, the thigh, the leg, and more lateral, you start seeing the digit representation and then the face. Now, if we focus on the digit representation, what you'll see is, that these guys in area three B are further subdivided into uh, different digits and different paths within the digit in area three B, which tells you that the receptive fields of these cells the, the, are limited to a single pad and a single digit in area three B. However, similar to the previous model, um, uh, the modality segregation model, a lot of these receptive fields have been largely characterized using our reliable tools. Very similar to what I explained before, where uh, experimenters go in and, and touch the different finger pads. So let me explain what the process is for those of you who have not done single unit recordings. So what we do is we put the electrodes into the brain and we lower those electrodes to target different areas, right? And as we're going down and driving um, electrodes, we're touching the animal or presenting visual information to the animal. And then we hear responses. And based on those responses, we say, ah, the, 
the receptive field of that cell is in you know digit two or in digit three or wherever. Then what we typically do is um, secure the animal's hand and, and, and present a very systematic, well-characterized set of stimuli to characterize or determine the cell's properties to those stimuli, right? But unfortunately, we typically only do it on one digit, on the digit that is initially thought of as the hotspot, right? So, um, so, uh, sorry. So um, I should mention that, you know, because of these, yeah, because of these um, uh, mapping studies, if you will, you know, what has been determined is that yes, um, cells in area 3B are typically confined to a single digit and a, and a single pad. And it's in area one, two, and beyond, these receptive fields start growing, obviously through convergence, right, um, of the inputs. However, there's been some studies, um, uh, particularly from John Cass's group, that shows that in area 3B, there are some cells that have multi-digit complex receptive fields that might extend to the to cross paths within a finger and even across fingers. So what they did was um, these are anesthetized recordings where they presented different stimuli to different parts of, of the animal's finger or across fingers. And what they found was um, that some cells um, in area 3B responded to, to inputs uh, outside uh, the finger. So let me explain what that means, I'll type that what that means. This is a graph, uh, um, um, instantaneous firing rate graph of a stimulus that was delivered to what was called the preferred digit response of the preferred location here in the distal pad of digit three. And you can see you have this increase in activity at the really onset um, um, for that when the stimulus happens, right? However, when you pair that stimulus to another stimulus here, let's say in the um, a proximal pad of D1. Now uh, you, the response of that stimulant of that that stimulation decreased the um, uh, was decreased um, as compared to the response to the preferred control. When you offset the timing synchrony between the two by 50 milliseconds, that response e decreased even more. Right. So there seemed to be some, you know. Um, some uh, dynamic. Some dynamic. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Uh, between uh, these two uh, types of between uh, of cells in area three B across different digits. So here's what's unclear about this study is that unfortunately, I say this with great great sorrow, um, they, these, um, they collapse both the single unit and the multi-unit together. So it's unclear whether these effects that you see here are really due to just you know, effects of one single cell versus multiple cells that are just um, um, encoding different receptive fields. And it's unclear whether these receptive fields are driven by classical versus non-classical mechanisms. And then three, we don't know what the spatial temporal properties of these multi-digit receptive fields are. So um, what we did was we conducted a study to look at this question, these questions in more detail. So, and something very important here is that we were very, very careful as to make sure that we are strictly recording from area 3B. Because we went in with single, unlike what um, John Cassis did, they put in, um, electrodes in, into the brain that were fixed, so chronic electrodes, so they could you know, do histology and figure out exactly which electrode was in, uh, placed in, in the brain, where electrodes were placed in the brain. So here we take advantage of the single unit, um, traditional single unit recordings where you can advance and really isolate cells with um, great care. But um, we, we uh, make sure that we're recording in area 3B. And this is important because area 3B lives right below area one. And as we know, area one has large receptive fields. So how do we know that we're recording in area one versus area 3B? Well, it turns out that there's this beautiful, so re like incredibly repeatable uh, functional characteristics um, between area 3B and one, where as you're driving down with an electrode down area one, 
you start seeing that, okay, neurons start responding with, um, let's say you're in the digit three representation. They start responding in area one with uh, the hotspot in B3. As you move down the electrode, you start responding to the medial pad and as you keep moving down, then you start responding to the proximal pad. And then you keep driving down and then you start seeing that these responses start getting weak, uh, smaller. The receptive field starts to get smaller. But as you keep driving down, the progression is reversed, meaning now you start getting responses to the, um, to the proximal pad, you keep driving down to the medial pad and then to the distal pad. And that is a very, very well characterized functional marker for uh, the boundaries between area 3B and area 1. However, because pro the proximal pads are um, neighboring each other, well, we, we decided to, to be sure that we're in area 3B to just re make recordings from the distal pads of area 3B, right? So they're super deep and they're constrained, right? And then we perform systematic and statistical validation of the action potential waveform, which is the marker that we use in electrophysiology to say, yes, this is one single cell. And I'm happy to discuss later all the, all the fancy and very rudimentary and like, uh, you know, uh, statistical tests that we did to ensure that this was uh, a, a single action potential waveform. Um, so, we train animals on, a, again, a visual discrimination task, and we presented, we were blind as to the receptive field of the cell, right? What we did was, as soon as we isolated the cell, okay, we're gonna present stimuli on all of these different fingers, and the stimuli were oriented bars with different, obviously, orientation um, um, uh, randomly across the different paths. So we recorded from two monkeys, four hemispheres, 405 neurons, um, and we partition the data into 20 millisecond bins and we, we assign significance, meaning a digit was responsive if the response of that digit was below the 0.01 level for at least two consecutive bins relative to baseline. Okay. So here's a neuron or a, um, a response of a neuron with a receptive field in um, digit four. Um, and so what you can see on the x-axis is time aligned to the stimulus, y is the firing rate of that neuron, and the inset here is the action potential waveform shape of that cell, right? So you can see that this neuron responds to, has a single digit, has a, has a receptive field on a single digit. However, we find that other neurons in area 3B have receptive fields with, that, that include two, three, and sometimes four digits. So here's an example on the lower left corner of a cell with, um, with uh, uh, receptive fields across two digits and particularly D5 and D4. And you can see something very important is that the action potential waveform are undistinguishable from each other, right? So you're certain that you're recording from the same cell because you haven't moved the electrode, the shapes are the same. And um, uh, in addition to a variety of other um, um, manipulations that we did, statistical validations that we did, right? So when we look at the population level, we see that yes, the vast majority of cells, uh, about 50% of cells have a single digit receptive field, uh, but 50% of cells have multi-digit receptive fields, right? So uh, 22 and, and the amount um, of the population decreases with digit size, right? So 22% are, multi-digit or two digits, 15, three digits and 15, four digits, okay? Importantly, what we find also is that the response location of the second most responsive digit, it's neighboring the preferred response, right? So there's commonality across, um, or there's a relationship, a systematic relationship between the uh, receptive field size, right? So this is a, on the x-axis, it's a digit location um, of the, non-preferred stimulant, non-preferred digit to the preferred digit, right? So one digit away or two digits away or three digits away in either direction, right? Um, and the y-axis is the percentage of time. So what you can see is about 70 plus 70% 70 of cells have a, the second most responsive digit to um, neighboring the preferred digit, right? So 
An interesting phenomenon that we observed um, or that we wanted to char characterize was the timing dynamics of these. Are these mechanisms, are these multi-digit receptor fields um, emerging from synaptic input from the thalamus, direct synaptic input from the thalamus, or are they arriving from some other source, some, some feedback source, as we saw in the proprioceptive case, in the proprioceptive integration case. So to do this, uh, what we did was we partitioned the spiking activity again into 20 millisecond bins. Note that because we did this, our resolution is no better than 20 milliseconds. Um, and then determined the onset time of significance for each responsive digit. And then we sorted the digits based on that response onset time. Okay. So if according to the model that, you know, these receptive fields are mediated by common input from the thalamus, then if we looked at the fastest digit, um, then the responses of the second, the third, and the fourth responsive digit should be on the same order, right? So what we see here is a cumulative distribution function for um, the onset times uh, uh, of, of, of each digit for an x-axis is time and the y-axis is the probability. So the fastest onset time, fastest digit response with the median response time about zero milliseconds. So anywhere between zero and 20 milliseconds, we'd like to call this, right? And here's the distribution. For the second response uh, fastest digit, we see that that time now is now delayed to about four, uh, 20 milliseconds, anywhere between 20 and 40. For the third, it's even more delayed. And for the fourth, it's even more delayed. So there's a systematic relationship and the, again, the, the onset time of these uh, response, um, of, of, of these um, multi-digit receptive uh, uh, cell types, i.e. the receptive field size uh, emerges from a uh, feedback mechanism. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it grows with time. All right, so, so far we've discussed the dynamics of how these multi-digit receptive fields, um, are, what, 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 what they are. But a fundamental questions of haptics is whether they have any bearings to spatial processing, right? That's key. Um, and so uh, neurons um, studies have shown that neurons in area 3B uh, have a critical role in encoding orientation signals um, that are key to meet the, the, um, uh, decoding edges for objects or, or mediating the perception of uh, edges for objects. So here's a, uh, an example cell of an area 3B cell um, that uh, where we, where have we, this is from Shao 1993, I believe. Uh, they presented to the monkey different oriented bars to D3. And you can see the cell in area 3B as a preferred orientation or preferred response to oriented bars around um, this angle, uh, right? Uh, studies from Benzmaya uh, show that um, these or the orientation selectivity of area 3B is high, definitely in comparison to rapidly adapting or slowly adapting one fibers, um, and very comparable to area one. However, because uh, area 3B super, uh, precedes area one in, pro in sensory processing time, then it was concluded that this the area that orientation tuning is first takes place in neocortex at the level of area 3B, right? And these mechanisms, these orientation selectivity happen or take or emerge from mechanisms uh, between interactions between inhibitory and excitatory subfields, as shown by Di Carlo here, where excitatory uh, subfields have a particular orientations and are typically flanked by inhibitory lobes that are also um, orientation tuning. So we wanted to address the question of whether um, the or, so these multi-digit receptive fields, whether they also share common uh, orientation tuning. So this is a multi-digit receptive field uh, with the preferred response in digit two. And what you can see is that this neuron has a clear preference for an orientation uh, around 67.5 uh, degrees. When you present the same type of stimuli in digit three, you see that this neuron responds very nicely, very commonly to um, the same stimulus, right? And notice that I normalize the firing rate to accommodate for the difference in firing rate across the digits, obviously. Basically emphasize 
the response selectivity to the oriented um, to the oriented angle. And then when you look at um, uh, digit four, uh, you see that this neuron is also tuned, although the tuning changes a little bit. Right. So when we look at the uh, the, the orientation selectivity across receptive field size, we see that um, the orientation index changes or decreases as the receptive field of that cell becomes larger. And that makes sense, right? Now you're pulling in more, more noise across different, um, across different digits, right? Um, however, this effect is almost approaching significance or uh, at the 0.01 level. So to be clear, the x-axis is the receptive field size of the cells. So two digit, three digit, four digit. And in the y-axis is the orientation index derived through this equation. So zero means no orientation selectivity. One means selectivity for just one cell, for just one orientation. So um, next, the next question that we wanted to ask, so we have these orientation selective cells that are tuned across different digits, but we don't know what the relationship across the different digits are, right? So we know that there are some cells that have the same type of tuning, right, or preference um, uh, across different digits. But to our surprise, there was a large number of cells that have uh, the cells shifted, the preferred orientations of the cells across digits shifted by either 22.5 or 45 degrees. Right. When we look, um, uh, so these. These are plots where we have on the x-axis the orientation angle, the y-axis is the normalized firing rate, and in blue is the response of that cell to the preferred digit, and in red is the response of that cell to the different orientation of the second preferred digit. Right. So then, um, uh, when we look at the population level and quantify this this relationship, right, on the on the right here you see polar plots of the orientation angle difference between the preferred and non-preferred digits. What you can see is that most of these cells um, have orientation difference across preferred and non-preferred digits, primarily around 22.5 degrees, uh, some 45, some 67.5, right? Very little around 90 or zero degrees. This is fully better captured in this linear regression analysis here. On the y, on the x-axis is there was, is there was the preferred orientation of the preferred digit, right? And in the y-axis is the preferred orientation of the non-preferred digit. You can see there's a systematic um, linear relationship between the, um, or the orientation uh, of the preferred digit and the preferred orientation of the non-preferred digit that's about 25 degrees with fairly good slope and um, fairly good uh, correlation. So um, in summary, what I've shown you is that area 3B has cell uh, the uh, uh, cells with multi um, with multi digit receptive fields, and that these multi digit receptive fields emerge from feedback mechanisms. Um, and this, uh, the the cells with multi digit receptive fields have preferred orientation responses. They are angle shifted across digits. All right. So I'm going to take the, these last couple of minutes to summarize um, all of these data into a working model that our lab is currently working on. Right. So. Receptive field expansion in area 3B, as I showed you er, uh, earlier, the, the canonical model says that you have inputs from the thalamus that are uh, with the same receptive field, they, they synapse onto cells um, in area 3B. And from area 3B, they synapse onto area one and two, and now you start getting convergence, right? And so that's where the receptive field size uh, grows. However, we propose an alternative model where, um, oops, sorry, uh, where yes, the inf inputs coming from the thalamus will, will give you um, a, um, will initially be uh, responding to a single digit, but then the receptive field of those cells, of area 3B cells, will start to grow. They're driven by inputs on a serial basis, a serial time basis, inputs coming from other digits. Um, and so and so and so forth, right? And there's a new study that came out. This was actually to my surprise. A new study by Dan O'Connor, which I just read yesterday, it came out sometime this month um, by Dan O'Connor's group in uh, in mouse. So caveat in mouse, 
what they found that inputs from a rapid, very fast synaptic uh, pathway from S2 to S1 um, um, to S1 in the mouse, which is uh, orient which is orientation cell specific and columnar specific, suggesting that that might be a pathway for since S2 has larger receptive fields, might be a pathway for, for which that mediates this growing of receptive fields in area 3B, right? So something to validate in a primate model. So what do the, all these data mean for object, psychologic processing? So I showed you before, right, that or told you before that the, the way we think about uh, our working model of object perception is that, you know, these, um, uh, uh, object in, in, in the sense of touch, it gets derived by integrating the proprioceptive inputs, i.e. the spatial distribution of the fingers that enclose the object with the local sensory cues here, right? And so based on those inputs, you can say, ah, this is a ball or so on. We like to extend this model by suggesting that these neurons, these multimodal, multi-digit area 3B cells play a fundamental role in this process. Remember that I told you that this integration process the model, the canonical model says that, oh, that happens way later, S2 probably, right? We want to say no, is that this thing gets, these, this process starts to emerge much earlier in the system. And these multimodal, multi-digit area 3B cells play a fundamental role. And this is how they play a fundamental role. So you have these cells that have multi-digit receptive fields. And as we showed you before, well, there are some cells that have the cross-digit orientation, the preferred angle, is shifted by different by different um, angles, right? So what does that mean? So what that means is that in certain, in, instead of just presenting or the local profile being symmetric across the different fingers, now I can start computing objects that are not symmetric, right? Objects that look like cones or triangles, and by varying the degree of the phase shift across the different um, orientation angles, I can start computing things that are more narrow, more um, uh, sharper, if you will, in, in shape, right? Um, cells that are uh, common, have common orientation um, fields can now be used to encode things like squares, right? Um, uh, shape. And importantly, I showed you that these neurons are responsive to proprioception. So these inputs or these derivations of, you know, uh, you know triangular or what a hexagonal shape um, uh, object can be represented in multiple size dimensions, right? So um, hope with that, uh, end with that. Um, I want to thank uh, people in the Shao lab, my previous lab, uh, especially Steve Shao, my mentor, who unfortunately passed away. Um, and Song Soo Kim, who was driving force between uh, driving force in recording the proprioceptive and integration data set, and Ali Trusinski was driving force in recording the area three B neurons. Um, people in my lab and my funding sources. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. Oh, let me stop recording.